Please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, we're continuing to look at Paul giving his testimony before uh, King Agrippa and Festus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read the uh, entire chapter and then ask you to stand when we get to the portion of Acts 26 that we're looking at this morning. That's going to begin in verse 19. So remember, this is Paul uh, giving his, his defense before Agrippa and Festus and letting them know uh, why he does the things that he does. And so I'm going to begin here in verse 1 and then ask you to stand in verse 19. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusation of the, of the Jews, especially because you're familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but Rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me and if you'd stand with me as we continue reading the portion of Scripture that we're considering uh, together this morning, uh, beginning here in verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying, both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles." And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king arose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them and When they had withdrawn, they said to one another, 
This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. You may be seated. May God encourage and strengthen us through the reading of his word together as a body this morning. And Father, we turn our hearts to you in humility this morning, asking that you and your kindness would open your word to us, you would change us, that you would help us to be bold as we also uh, like Paul here, seek to proclaim the truths of your son, Jesus, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, let's remember what's uh, taken place as we come to this section of the book of Acts. Paul is appearing before this governor, Festus, and Festus has this problem. He has said to Paul that he will send him to Rome, he'll send him to Caesar, but he's not quite sure what to write to Caesar concerning the crimes of which Paul is accused. During this time, while he's trying to figure out what to do with Paul, King Agrippa and his sister Bernice arrive in Caesarea. And King Agrippa, having a background with with Jews, considering himself Jewish, calling himself the king of the Jews, uh, Festus knows that Agrippa has this background. And so he says, Agrippa, I, I need your help. Can you kind of listen to this guy, Paul, and, and listen to what he says and, and help me know what to write to Rome concerning Paul. And Agrippa said, I'd, I'd very much like to hear Paul, and Festus says, you will. And so on the day when Paul appears before them, they're in the audience, so the, the auditorium, there are military officers and the high officials of the city, and Agrippa and his sister Bernice and Festus are all there in the audience hall, and Paul begins to give his defense. And we began looking at Paul's testimony last week. And Paul's testimony serves as a, a great example for us as to how we should present our testimony, our, our story of, of witness to God's work in our lives. And as we talked about last week, all of us are going to have opportunities in which we can give our testimony, where we can talk to people about what God has done in our lives. There are our, our, our time of baptism is a time where we give our testimony, or the, the time when we're talking with our family members, or we're, we're meeting someone for the first time and they're asking questions about us. We have these, these opportunities in which we can give our, our testimony, testifying, witnessing to the work that God has done in our lives. Now, of course, sometimes we struggle as we give our testimonies, Right? Uh, some of us have a tendency maybe to overshare, you know, we're, we're talking about what God has done and, and we, like, we go back and, and we are giving every detail of our lives and we are just kind of uh, sucking all the air out of the room as, as we talk and kind of go on and on and on. Uh, sometimes whenever Whitney and I leave an event, like a, a care group or a Bible study, at the end of the night I'll ask her, I'll say, hey, did I, did I talk too much? I mean, was, how, how much did I, did I talk? She goes, ah, you scale one to ten, nine, or you know, whatever it is. And so, uh, you know, we all do that, right? We all have a tendency sometimes to, to overshare. And as you look at Paul giving his, his testimony in different places in the book of Acts, it's interesting the details, depending upon the audience that he, that he puts in or the details that he leaves out. And so, for example, in this testimony, he doesn't talk about Ananias. He doesn't talk about this interaction with Ananias, as, as Luke records his words here. It's, it's not relevant to the, to the audience that he's, that he's talking to here. They wouldn't care about a, a pious Jew. Some of us have a tendency, though, to, to undershare, maybe not to give enough details. Or sometimes when people share with me what they're planning on saying in their baptism, they'll, they'll give a very beautiful testimony. I'll say, yeah, that, that is great. But as you've shared, you've kind of assumed that the people that you're talking to, this happens all the time, uh, that, that you're assuming that the people you're talking to are already Christians. And so kind of think about what you're saying. And some of the, the words that we use that are code words that Christians kind of know what we mean. Uh, you know, I then I became a Christian. Okay, kind of flesh that out for me. What did you do to become a Christian? What did you understand? How did you respond to the truths of the gospel? Sometimes we can undershare, or sometimes we can leave out important doctrinal truths about sin and about the penalty of sin. So some of us can overshare, some of us can undershare. One of the things that I struggle with in sharing my testimony is in not asking for a response of the person with whom I'm sharing, kind of helping them understand, hey, this isn't just a story about Daniel. This is a story about God's work, and you also need to think about these truths that I'm, I'm sharing with you. And so the beautiful thing, though, despite the mistakes we make in sharing the gospel and sharing our testimonies, the beautiful thing is that, that God 
uses even our, our poor testimonies, right? That God in his kindness draws men and women and children to himself through our imperfect sharing of the gospel. Here's the main thing that I want us to continue looking at this morning. Again, it's a little bit of a long statement, but it's a two-weeker, so we'll kind of give ourselves an out there. Here's, the, here's what I want us to see about a testimony as we look at Paul's testimony here in Acts. A testimony shares the story of how God transformed me and saved me by grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and calls those who hear it to also repent and believe the gospel. So what am I doing? I'm sharing, here's my story. Here's what God did as he transformed me and then saved me by by, by his grace as I place my faith in his son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of my sins. And as I'm sharing that testimony, there's also an explicit and implicit call for them to do the same thing. Look, here, you also, like I repented and believed the gospel, you also need to repent and believe the gospel. That's what's happening as we share our testimony. It shares the story of how God transformed me and saved me by grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and a testimony calls those who hear it, to also repent and believe the gospel. And as we looked at Paul's story, we saw there's kind of four, four components to it that we, we want to consider. First of all, we looked at how it uh, talks about who I was, right? And Paul does that in verses 1 through 11. Here's who I, who, here's, here's who I was. And then a testimony, in that first section, Paul is saying, look, I was just like those uh, who are now accusing me. I, I did horrific things. And the irony of Paul's story, the irony of all stories apart from Jesus Christ, is that the very things that we think we are doing in order to worship God are actually things that we are doing in rebelling against God. And so the, the more we seek to worship God, the more we are rebelling against God apart from Jesus Christ. In that first section of our testimony, what are we trying to communicate to people? We are trying to communicate to people the futility of life apart from Christ, the hopelessness of life apart from Christ, the pervasiveness of sin. That's who I was, says Paul. Then in verses 12 through 18, Paul talks about what God did talks about what God did. He next describes God's divine intervention, and, and we do the same things as we share our testimony. We talk about, here, here's what God divinely did as he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to die for my sins. He, he lived a perfect life and died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, and now as I place my faith in Jesus Christ, I've received Christ's righteousness, and he's taken upon himself my sin, this divine transference. That's what we're sharing as we talk about what God did. We're also talking about how God divinely intervened by revealing this truth to us. And so it's not just that God provided his son, Jesus Christ. He also revealed his son, Jesus Christ, and his salvific work to us. And as we share this part of our testimony, we can be sharing things about how God allowed us to understand the gospel message. Maybe we, we talk about an experience we had with our our. Our, our church or experience we have with our, our parents as they proclaim the gospel to us or, or a friend. And so we're talking about, look, this is what God did. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. He, he revealed it to me in his word. And then here's how circumstantially he allowed me to, to discover that truth as he worked within my heart to draw me to himself. That brings us to where we are this morning, that the third part of Paul's testimony in verses 19 through 23, he says, now, Here's who I am now. Here's who I am now. And let's look at what Paul says. Look at your text. And let's look at verse 19. Verse 19, he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I'm now living in obedience to God. You asked me why I'm doing what I'm doing, why the Jews are so upset. Here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I have this divine intervention, this, this heavenly vision, and it told, God told me to do what I'm doing through that, and I'm not being disobedient to that. I'm being obedient to it. Now, understand what Paul is saying here. He's saying that he is in obedience to this instruction given to him by God himself. And as he shares what 
God told him to do, the message that he's been called to proclaim is a message that has implications for everyone who's hearing him. So it's not just Paul's life that needs to change if what he's saying is true, but Agrippa is going to have to change if what Paul's message says is true. That's very clear in how Paul presents this. Festus's life is going to have to change. Bernice's life is going to have to change. The, the people who are hearing him, who are military officials, their lives are going to need to change. There's no one's life in the audience that, that's listening to him speak whose life doesn't need to change if what Paul is saying is true about God's divine mission for him. So he says, my life has changed, and there's three things I want you to notice here about the change that takes place in Paul's life. Number one, notice this, as he shares, we see that the change was immediate. The change was immediate. It says in verse 20, I, I wasn't disobedient to the, the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus. So that's where I was, and so I didn't, I didn't think, okay, God's told me to do this. I'll kind of mull it over and decide whether or not I want to, to do this. No, immediately I began to do what God had called me to do. A sign of, of obedience is that it's immediate, right? My, my parents had a saying whenever I was a, a kid, slow obedience is no obedience. Maybe you've used that expression with your children as well. We've certainly used that as we were talking to our kids. They're, they're playing with the Legos. They say, hey, it's, it's time to, to, to put up the Legos and go to bed. No response. Oh, I didn't hear you. Okay, eventually, you know, that, that, that's not obedience. It's, it's delay. You know, what, what's obedience? Okay, yeah, I'll do that. And, and even, if, even if they want to spend a little time, we, we always tell our kids, okay, you can talk to us about an instruction we give, but the first response needs to be a response of obedience. Hey, it's time to put the Legos up. Okay, I will. Do you mind if I first, I'm on step four of five of this Lego building instruction. They're always like 50 steps, but, you know. Can I just finish this last step? I, oh, yeah, sure, just finish that up, and then, okay, I will. You know, there's a response of obedience that shows that there's a, an immediate response, shows that there's a heart of obedience. And so Paul's change, first of all, we see here, it's, it's immediate. The second thing that I want you to see about the change is the change was profound. It wasn't a superficial change. It was a profound change. And look again at verse 20. He says he obeyed this heavenly vision, and... It says that he declared first to those in Damascus, and then, look at the rest of verse 20, also in Jerusalem, and throughout all the, the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles. And what was he proclaiming? He was proclaiming that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now, that is a very, very different message than he was proclaiming just moments before, Right? In his life. He was persecuting people and doing horrific things to the people who were proclaiming that message. Now he's proclaiming that exact same message he used to be persecuting people for proclaiming. He says he called them to repent. What does repent mean? Repent very broadly means to change one's mind. And we see that Throughout the book of Acts, we've talked about this, people are called to, to repentance. That's to, to change one's mind. And, and what, is, what exactly does that mean? It means I'm, I'm walking on a path of sin. And as I'm walking on this path of sin and, and delighting in sinful things, God in his grace reveals to me that this is sin. So, for example, for Paul, he, he is, is persecuting Christians, and God in his grace reveals to him, hey, that's, that's sin. And so there's this intellectual component of repentance. Okay, this, this action that I'm doing is, is in disobedience to God. We also see in repentance in Scripture that there's a, 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 an emotional response to, to sin. Okay, I intellectually understand this is sin, and I, I no longer desire to do this. This is a this is a thing that causes me grief. This thing that I thought was bringing me joy is actually causing me grief. And then there's also a, a volitional component to repentance, a, a decision. Okay, I, I'm walking this path. I understand now that it's sin. It grieves me, and I, I desire to turn from this. I, I want to turn away from this sin. I want to turn to God. That's, that's repentance. Repentance is not a work. 
It's not something we, we do in order to gain favor with God. It's something that God grants. I'm, I'm walking on a path of rebellion to God, and then there's a, a change of mind about that sin, and I, I, I don't just change my mind about it. There's a turning. Notice it says here in verse 20, I was proclaiming repent, repentance and turning. To turn from sin, re- repent of sin, and turn to God. Repent and turn to God, and then perform deeds in keeping with the repentance. That's very similar to what he said in verse 18. I was called to open their eyes so they could turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what Jesus tells Paul he's to proclaim. And throughout, again, Luke's writings, he really develops this theme in his work, the importance of repentance and turning. In Luke chapter 3, as John the Baptist is proclaiming the gospel, he calls people to, to repent or preparing the way for the gospel message. He calls people to repent. The very first gospel message in the book of Acts, remember, uh, Peter is presenting the gospel. He's, he's preaching. And as he, he preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 2, people are convicted as they realize that they have crucified the Messiah. And they say, okay, Peter, what do we do in response to this? And, and what does Peter say? He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He uses that word repent to describe that that process of of repenting and turning to God in faith. Repent and believe, repent and, and place your faith in. Those are kind of words that are used interchangeably in the book of Acts, all describing that turning from sin to God in faith. Faith and belief, two sides of the same coin. Repentance isn't a work. It's not something we do to earn our salvation. It's something that God grants us. It's a change of heart about sin. I was uh, talking with my sister this past week about how the, the little nieces and, and nephew are doing, and she began to describe kind of the things that they're doing. We saw them in May, but even since then, they're that age where they just change a lot over a month, Right? And so they're, they're talking more, they're more verbal, and she's telling me about some, some of the things, like they start, they're, they're playing pretend, and they, they pretend like they're going to parties now and things like that. And so uh, it's just interesting. They haven't changed in terms of their personality. They're, they're still the same sweet kids that they, they were when they were here in May. But as they, as they gain an understanding of the world, as they gain kind of a, an intellectual ability to communicate, it's just funny to see that same personality and the the same things that they loved as little kids, they, or little, little tiny kids. Now as they become a little older, tiny kids, they, they can communicate in a different way. But same, right? That's not the type of change that we're talking about here. Paul doesn't change his entire personality, become a completely different person in terms of his intellectual ability, in terms of his personality. What happens here is, is more fundamental. It's a, it's a heart change. He's now doing the very thing he put people in prison and even to death for. Now the people that he persecuted are his brothers and sisters. His allies before are now his persecutors. And, and all this, he says in verse 21, this, this, because of this change being so profound, that's the reason why, verse 21, that's the reason why the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. I am totally different, not just in terms of degree, but fundamentally in terms of, of kind. I've changed. The change is immediate. The change is profound. The change is enduring. Number three, the change is enduring. Look at verses 22 through 23. It's not just a passing fancy. It's, It's permanent. It says, I've continued to this day. And notice once again, as he describes the, the change, he's presenting the gospel. He says, to this day I've had the help that comes from God, and I stand here testifying to everybody in this room, small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. And so as he's talking about who he is now, who I am now, he's talking about this profound change, and he's once again working in the gospel. He says, "Uh, I've been testifying, hint, hint, here's the gospel, that the Christ, Jesus, must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and and to the Gentiles, that's what I have been doing. Remember we talked about the gospel needs to communicate to people who God is and 
uh, to, that we're accountable to him. We need to communicate to, to people uh, who we are, that we're sinners. We need to communicate what God has done in sending Jesus Christ to his son, and then we need to communicate to them how they need to respond to that. And what has Paul done? Over and over again, he's presented the gospel message. Look, we're sinners. Christ had to come. He had to suffer. That's a message we see over and over again in the book of Acts, that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer for our sins, and now we receive forgiveness by placing our faith in him. Paul brilliantly, as he shares his story and who he is now and who he was, continues to communicate the gospel. A couple points I want to bring out here as, as we think about how to apply this. First of all, for your testimony, as you share your story with other people, you need to proclaim to them and help them understand how you are different than who you used to be. Now, maybe you were saved at a very young age, and, and you, you, know, you don't have stories of, of just doing uh, incredible, terrible things that, you know, as an as a, as a elementary school student or whatever. But I, I think all of us can still say, look, b- before God divinely intervened in my life, I was different than I, I am now. Now, God in his grace didn't allow me to, to pursue all the things I could have pursued apart from him, but, but I'm, I'm different now. And, and as, I, as I proclaim this in my testimony, I'm not claiming perfection. I'm not attempting to be some sort of hypocrite. But the, the people that we're sharing the gospel with, the people with whom we're sharing the gospel, need to grasp the need to repent and believe. We are no longer defined by what we used to do because we are no longer who we used to be. Something profound has taken place in our lives. And that needs to come through in our testimonies. Now, that brings me to, to a second point I want to make as, as we think about how to apply this truth about who I am now. And I want to say this very carefully, but, but I think this is very biblical. If you are not a changed person, you are not in Christ. If you're a person whose life has not been transformed by the gospel, you, you're not a Christian 2 Corinthians 13 says this, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you. So who you were is a person separated from Christ, living a futile life. Who you are now is a person in whom God himself resides. You're united with with the, the triune God. And so if there's been no change, something hasn't happened. Paul continues, unless indeed you fail to meet the test, I hope you will not find out, I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. In other words, there, there should be this, this change that's taken place. And you need to ask yourself, am I a different person? Am I in Christ? Have I truly believed? Have I turned from sin and place my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I I used to attend a church that didn't believe you needed to repent in order to become a Christian. They they believed that repentance was a work, and they said, well, look, we we are saved by God's grace apart from works, and so if if we're adding repentance, we're adding works to salvation. It was very confusing to me as I I talked with with a pastor there. I, I appreciated I appreciated their desire to separate works from salvation. We are not saved by any works we do, but they really had a fundamental misunderstanding of what repentance is. Repentance is not some work we do, although works flow from genuine biblical repentance. But repentance is something that God grants as he changes our thinking about sin. Repentance is from God, is simultaneous with faith. Peter's second sermon, we talked about his first sermon, his second sermon, Acts 3.19, same thing. Repent, therefore, he says, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance precedes forgiveness and salvation. I want to be very careful, right? I have these evergreen trees uh, in, our, in our yard. I've, 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 every year for the past two years, I've purchased five evergreen trees from the Arbor Day Foundation. And they come, little, little tiny guys, 
and I, I plant them in the back of our field, and I have this dream. Sorry, I get choked up just thinking about it. I, I have this dream that these little guys will, will grow into Christmas trees, and uh, I'll, I'll plant them, and I, I put stuff around them, and then uh, in the summers, I, I, I wheel out water to these little guys and, and tenderly try to water them during the hot summer months. I, but I can't, I'm, I'm thinking about Christmas. I'm, I'm waiting for the day that these things become Christmas. I guess you could say I'm pining for that day, really. <laughs> really longing for it. Not everyone in our family loves these trees the way I do. Several members, several members of the family have attempted to kill uh, these trees. They've run over them with lawnmowers. They've weed whacked them. <laughs> I, I, was, I run this all by my family. I ran this by Whitney first. And she goes, okay, you can share that, but you're also going to mention how you haven't mowed the lawn in years, right? <laughs> and I said, Whitney, we don't have time to get into all the details. No one, no one in the church cares about all the details of our family. No. No, but the people have attempted to, to kill them, to kill these, these precious little trees, and weed whacked them and mowed over them, and, uh, and then they try to cover it up, too. You know. I'll come in one time after watering them and say, hey, what, what happened to, to, to Dasher and Prancer? <laughs> two, of the, two of the trees, she goes, who's that? Uh, you know, two, my two evergreen trees, you know, row two and uh, aisle three of the, the trees, and, and, uh, and, and someone in the family said, we hoped you didn't notice, and uh, and it's just this, this, this brown stump. I was going to notice it, right? So, so several times the, the trees have, have faced, uh, faced the wrath of our family. And, and I always hope against hope there's life still in the tree. And sometimes I, I keep watering and, and caring for, for a little dasher, and he, and he comes back, right? There's, there's the little green buds that come, a little, little growth. And he's, okay, it's still alive. And other times, it's just, it becomes like progressively more and more just this, this stick in the ground, you know, and it's dead, right? As, as we think about the Christian life we're, and, and the new life that's, that's happened, we're not saying there's always perfection. And sometimes there's, there's the appearance even of, of death. But the Christian life, the Christian life begins and it continues with, with repentance and it continues with sanctification, becoming more and more like God and, and, and devoted to his glory. And as we, as we look at the Christian life, we even so sometimes it's, it's a little bit, sometimes it's a lot, we, we should see life. If there's no life there, if there's no, no fruit, we, we recognize, okay, this, this is death. This is not live faith. The works aren't what cause repentance, they're, they're, they're the fruit of it, but we still should see the fruit of, of something that's there. J.C. Ryle, in his book Holiness, has some wonderful words of wisdom regarding sanctification. Let me just read a couple of his thoughts on sanctification to you. It's a, a great chapter on sanctification, growing in devotion to God's uh, holiness, to, to be, grow, growing our devotion to God's holiness. It says, number one, one thing he says is sanctification is the invariable result of that vital union with Christ which true faith gives a, to a Christian. As John says, he that, as Jesus says in the book of John, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much truth, uh, more, much, much fruit. Uh, the, the faith which doesn't have a sanctifying influence on the character is no better than the faith of devils, writes Ryle. Secondly, and another thing he writes, is that sanctification is the outcome and inseparable consequence of regeneration. He that is born again and made a new creature receives a new nature and a new principle and always lives a new life. Another truth that he gives about sanctification, it's the only certain evidence of that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is essential to salvation. He also says it's the only sure mark of God's election. He writes, even though our, who God has elected and not elected is, is secret, it's his mystery, he says, but if there's one thing clearly and plainly laid down about election, it's this, that elect men and women may be known and distinguished by holy lives. We want to be careful here. I want to be careful. I remember one time my dad was talking to me about a, a famous pastor that was talking about the need to repent. He says, boy, that guy just has a, a church full of people who don't know whether or not they're even saved. And we want to be careful not to create doubt where there doesn't need to be doubt. But we do want to say this. As we think about who I am now, there must be evidence of new life 
We don't want to preach legalism. This is what you must do to please God. We are pleased by God's grace to receive Jesus Christ in faith. But we have to grasp this. Where there's a new heart, there's life. And Paul is saying, look, I could no longer be viewed with favor by the, by the high priest or the other people with whom I was in relationship before. That's inevitable for the Christian life. God makes it clear those who are uh, in him. Here's the next thing we need to think about, what we must do. What we must do is, as we hear the gospel message, what do you need to do in response? And I, I was asking our care group on Friday night, I said, you know, what, what's the hardest part for you in, in sharing your testimony or sharing the gospel? And uh, some people said for them the hardest thing was to get started. You know, you, you have a, a relationship with someone and you, maybe you've been in a relationship for a long time. And you, how do you begin to talk about spiritual things? I said, you know, I, I kind of have an easy in. You know, as soon as I talk about what I do for a living, uh, it's, the, the conversation gets get spiritual easier for me probably than for most people. But I'll say this is the hardest thing for me is getting to this part of the conversation where I, I encourage a person to respond to the truths of the gospel that we talk about. Here's, here's what Paul says. or here's, So Paul has just said in verse 23, uh, it's kind of, again, described the gospel, that the Christ, the Messiah, must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, so again, he's, he's keeping the resurrection of Jesus Christ central here, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And there's actually, as we think about it, there's been an, an implicit call to repent throughout the entire presentation that Paul has given. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, he says, again, to open their eyes so that they may, this is Jesus, speaking to Paul, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so think about this as Paul is saying, hey, by the way, everybody who's listening to me in this room, Jesus told me to proclaim this, that people need to turn from Satan to him. People need to turn from darkness to light. As he shares that, what is that? That's an implicit call. Hey, I've been called to give this message. I'm giving this message. You need to respond to it. Verse 20, he says, I, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly mission, I, vision. I declared what I declared to Jews and Gentiles, hint, hint, those of you in this room, that they should repent and turn to God. So turn from sin, turn to God, and then perform deeds in keeping with their repentance, the fruit that comes from genuine, biblical, God-given repentance. Then, verses 22 through 23, I have kept doing what I'm supposed to do, testifying to small, to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, and again, the gospel. Christ must suffer, being the first to rise from the dead. He will proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now, Festus becomes uncomfortable. Things get awkward. And I think a lot of times, if, if you're like me, we try to stop just short. Me, you have a, a high sense of awkward situations, right? You're like, okay, I have just made something awkward, and I'm uncomfortable, and everyone in the room is uncomfortable, and uh, I, need to, I need to back off a little bit, right? Never liked that, that feeling of, of seeing someone embarrass themselves, right? especially if I'm the person embarrassing themselves. But Paul listens to what Festus says, and Festus, Festus says, you're crazy. You're crazy. I mean, your great learning has driven you out of your mind. You don't even know what, what you're saying. And if I was sharing the gospel with someone, and I began talking about the resurrection, and they said, you're crazy, I'd say, well, you know, I'd Glad I had the opportunity to share with you. <laughs> you want to kind of stop, right? Paul keeps pressing in. He gets explicit, and he gets explicit in order to force a response. Look at what he says in verse 25. Look, I'm, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I'm speaking true and rational words. And then he draws the attention to Agrippa. The king, you know, he has this quasi-Jewish background. He knows what I'm talking about. And so I'm speaking not timidly, but boldly. 
I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. He knows what I'm talking about. He knows about the prophets. He knows about Moses. He knows about the Messiah. And all that I'm saying is in keeping with that. I haven't hidden what I'm saying. I haven't done what I've, what I, I haven't uh, proclaimed this message in a corner. And then he gets incredibly specific. Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I've just shared who I was. I, I've shared what God did. I've shared who I am now, and that who I am now is someone that's living in obedience to God's divine vision and proclaiming the very message that the prophets have been proclaiming from the very beginning of God's revelation. And I'm asking you, do you believe? I, I, I know you believe. Like I, I know you say that you believe the prophets. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And Agrippa's response, it, it's, not, it's not entirely clear, but I think the ESV gets the, the sense of what he's saying here. He is uncomfortable, but he knows he's on the spot. He, can't, he has to make some sort of decision here. He doesn't want to say he doesn't believe the prophets, but he certainly doesn't want to say that he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he says, I, I'm not going to make that decision right now. But notice that Paul brings him to the point of, of forcing him to say whether or not he believes that, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he refuses to do that. He says in verse 28, Agrippa says to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And, and Paul says, look, I don't, I, I don't mind if it's short or long. What I desire is that not just you, but every person in this room would become like me. Not who I was, but on the basis of what God did, that they would become like who I am now. A person who has been changed, who's repented and, and placed their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Paul's response here shows that he has genuine care for every person in the room. I wish all of you would become like who I am now. I want you to move from being in rebellion to God to being in obedience to God through faith and repentance from dead works. He, he cares about every person in that room, hearing and believing the gospel. This is the hardest part for me. This is the, the moving to, to force a person or to, to really bring the conversation to a point where I say, look, is this something you believe? What, what do you believe about God? And, and are you willing to place your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? That, that's a hard step. Now, why is Paul able to do it? Why, why is Paul able to do this? Be, because he cares about the people in the room. Because he cares about the soul of Agrippa. So we're talking with, with, about this with our, our care group again on Friday night. Someone was talking about sharing the gospel with someone and, and, and sharing the gospel with that person because she, she, she loved him. She cared about him. That, 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 that's exactly right. Getting to this part of the conversation requires a deep love for the people with whom we're sharing. That's why Paul so consistently prays for boldness. Remember, we've seen this, we've seen the, the church praying for this in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 4, but remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. He, he says you need to be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And he says, and pray for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth, how? Boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare the gospel boldly as I ought. That's Paul's desire. That's what he asks people to pray for for him is what we need to pray for for one another. Here's the deal. We really don't know how God is going to use our, our testimony, even though our testimonies are sometimes told imperfectly. I can remember a number of years ago, I was a youth pastor, and I was, I was sharing my, my testimony with, with a young man called Matt. And as I shared my, my testimony and the gospel with Matt, Matt seemed... To, to, to want to talk about it, but when it came to that point of, of decision, he was, he was pretty adamant, you know, I, I, I don't desire to, to trust in Christ. And I walked away from that, that conversation 
we were actually at a baseball game, and I was sharing with him at the, at the baseball game there with the youth group, and, and I can remember walking away from that conversation there at the baseball game, just really discouraged. Like, hey, I just didn't quite share it the way that I, sh- I should have said this instead of that, and just walked away kind of discouraged. Years go by. I was talking with a, a, a friend of, of Matt, and she said, hey, I recently uh, ran into Matt, and I heard the story of how he became a believer. It's uh, whenever you, you shared the, the gospel with him. I said, no, 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 no. I, I shared the, he rejected the gospel whenever I shared it with him. She goes, well, was it at a baseball game? I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, well, I was talking with him, he, and he was actually sharing the story at, at an FCA. He had uh, heard a youth pastor give him the gospel at a baseball game and had gone home that night uh, to the, or gone to the hotel room that night, and that night had been convicted by God as he thought over that conversation and entrusted in Jesus Christ. And I had no idea he had placed his faith in Jesus Christ, not for years. And he, he never told me. It, was, uh, it just happened to run into someone that he had seen recently. The, the, the point is this. Look, many times we think we failed in sharing our testimony. We, we thought, we, I talked too long, I talked too quickly, or, or whatever. But here's, here's God's grace. He uses our story as we share what he's done in our lives, who we used to be, what he's done, who we are now, and what they need to do. He uses that in his grace. And his and in his kindness, his word, his gospel have a long shelf life, right? The things we share now, God, God may use in the moment. He may use in years to come. He may use even at the end of a person's life. The truths of the gospel can burrow deep within the heart of un, our unbelieving soul. It can very, very burrow deep within the heart of an unbelieving boss or spouse or son. And at the moment that God chooses, those truths can burst forth as God brings about a glorious salvation. A testimony shares the story of how God transformed me and saved me by grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and calls those who hear it to repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We we thank you that in your kindness, you have drawn us to yourselves. Lord, we, we... ask that you would help us to live lives of continual repentance. Help us to continue to, to see that the life-giving work of the Spirit being, being worked out. And we pray that as we grow in our, our holiness, we grow in our devotion to you, that you would give us a greater joy as we see other men and, and women and, and children responding to the truths of your Son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.